Hey everyone, uh, as Michael said, I'm Jess Archer. I'm on the Laravel core team. It's amazing to be back here again on this stage and I still can't believe that I work at Laravel now. Um, last time I was on this stage, I would not have believed you if you told me that that would be the case next time I was up here. Uh, so you might be wondering what I'm doing up here. You've probably heard maybe on Twitter, Laravel Pulse. Um, so today I'm here to tell you what Laravel Pulse is all about. So let's just come and close this one and we'll have a look at what Laravel Pulse is. So as some of you might have guessed, Laravel Pulse is a performance monitoring and insights tool to, manage the, uh, to monitor the vital signs of your Laravel applications. Now this was Taylor's idea and he did a bit of a proof of concept and then he handed it over to myself and Tim McDonald to get to build this. Uh, so I'm pretty excited that we get to launch it here in Australia. Something else that was launched here in Australia in 2018 was Laravel Telescope. And you might have heard of Laravel Telescope and maybe wondering how uh, that relates to Laravel Pulse. So Laravel Telescope is primarily a debugging tool that lets you see in depth everything about your application. It records full requests, every query, job, event that got dispatched in there, so you can kind of click through the request and see everything. So it's great for local development, but in production, it collects a lot of data, and so you end up needing to maybe turn off a lot of the watches, and um, yeah, maybe it just doesn't kind of suit for production on larger sites. Laravel Pulse, on the other hand, uh, gives you a high-level uh, aggregate view of your data, and it collects minimal data to do this. Uh, so this does not replace uh, existing error tracking tools, all this sort of stuff. It uh, will help to augment those tools. For many apps, it's probably going to be more than enough. Uh, but yeah, it certainly doesn't replace things that give you a lot more detail, uh, for example, with error trackers. Uh, so I'll just scroll down and kind of give you a little bit more of a look at what's going on here. But we will dive into more of these cards very shortly. Now, Laravel Pulse was designed specifically for Laravel. So unlike a lot of tools out there, Laravel Pulse knows in depth about Laravel. So it knows about the queuing system, the HTTP client, uh, all of the events that happen in Laravel. So it's very, very personalized for Laravel applications. Uh, it lets you view aggregate data. So if we come over here, we can click on our six hour one. And so we can view data for the last six hours. We can go for the last 24 hours and we can look over the last seven days. So we'll come back over to the one hour view here. Now it is self-hosted. So the data that it records is completely under your control, uh, which is good for compliance and just letting you kind of uh, you know, manage, manage everything on your side. Uh, it is ready to go after a simple composer require and then at what point it is accessible at the forward slash pulse. Now I will zoom in on this a little bit later as we start to dive into some of these things. In fact, I probably can go, yeah, maybe we'll go a couple for there for now. Uh, so it works on a uh, typical VPS hosting setup like you might have with Forge, but it also works with Laravel Octane, Laravel Vapor. It'll work pretty much anywhere you can run Laravel because it makes uh, use of Laravel's events. Uh, and those are obviously going to work anywhere where you can host Laravel. Uh, it is responsive. So if I was to come over here and let's try and get a, what should we do here? We'll do an iPhone 12. We can see the cards kind of collapse down here. We can scroll along here and still see the details up here. And we can scroll down. So you can monitor your application on the go if that's what you want to do. And it has a dark mode and light mode. So it will use your device preference by default, but we can go to light mode and I'm hoping I'm not gonna blind everyone here. Let's give this a go, boom. <laughs> so I wasn't sure whether to continue the demo with light mode or dark mode. I'm hearing dark mode a lot. Can I see some hands for dark mode? That's a lot of dark modes. All right, light mode people. <laughs> oh, okay. I reckon dark mode wins. So let's go over. Uh, I'm just going to choose my uh, system default because I prefer dark mode. So, <laughs> uh, all right. And best of all, it is completely free and open source. So uh, yeah, you'll be able to install this on your Laravel applications very, very soon. So I want to give a big thank you to Taylor 
for making it possible for Tim and I to work on this for you all and then to be able to give it away for free. So I'm very, very grateful to Taylor for that. All right, so let's start walking through some of the cards. So to start with at the top here, we have uh, the system stats. So we can see our CPU usage with a graph over the last hour or seven days, whatever your preference is, uh, the current memory usage and the current storage usage. So you can kind of keep an eye on when that storage is getting filled up with log files or whatever else. Uh, now, Laravel Pulse is designed to monitor a single Laravel application. However, a single Laravel application might be run on multiple servers, maybe it's load balanced, you've got database servers, all this sort of stuff. So I'm gonna jump over into my terminal here and I'm gonna come onto another server that's also running this demo. And I'm gonna say artisan pulse check. And we'll come back over here. And every 15 seconds, it'll take a reading of the system stats. So we should see pop up here pretty soon, uh, another server entry. Hopefully the live gods, live demo gods are on my side. Come on, maybe, maybe not. There it goes, awesome, okay. <laughs> now I'm gonna quickly come over here because this one also takes a little bit of time. I'm gonna stop this pulse check command. So we can see here, like we don't, we're not seeing a graph yet because obviously we only have one reading so we don't even have enough data points to draw like a little bit of a line. Uh, but we've stopped that pulse check command now. <laughs> And so after a while, Pulse is going to determine that server's not reporting in anymore. Uh, and so we should see it go into kind of like a offline state. That one does take potentially up to 30 seconds because it kind of gives it a little bit of leeway. Um, but we can also not have to wait forever for that one as well if it doesn't come up super soon. Come on. <laughs> there it goes. Okay, so we can see now this server has gone offline, at least as far as the pulse check command is concerned. All right. Uh, now, for the rest of the cards, I thought it would be fun, maybe a little bit crazy, to do a interactive demo with the audience, a live demo with real data. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over to my terminal where I've been, uh, I've got this demo command that's like sending fake requests to the system. So I'm gonna kill that one and I'm gonna reseed the database and we'll come back over here. And I've wiped everything except for the, um, the, the server grats, the stats, so we can still see our little graph there. But we've now got an empty dashboard. So we can scroll down and we'll see all of our empty cards here. All right. So I'm going to assign you all the role of flight admin at Acme Airlines. So for those of you that feel like you'd like to participate in this, if you jump on your phones or your laptops and go to acme.laracon.au, you'll be automatically logged in to your flight control dashboard where you can send some requests to Pulse. And I'll show you what that looks like for anyone that's uh, not playing along. Let's zoom this one. All right, so in here I can uh, sell tickets, I can raise prices, I can delay flights, so we've got loads coming in already. Excellent, and I can also refresh the stats over here. And so we can come over here and we'll start seeing these come through. Now, some of the uh, avatars today, it turns out, are not working. I will give it a quick refresh just to see if that helps it. Yeah, something about the uh, automatically generated avatars on the Wi-Fi network was not uh, playing ball. So you'd normally see avatars here. Um, all right, now, this app is deliberately slow and has some bugs. There is a little bit of magic going on because if it was really taking this long for every request, I would need a much bigger droplet to handle all those concurrent requests sitting around effectively doing nothing. Uh, so let's talk about this application usage card. So I can zoom in here a little bit. All right, so here we can see the top 10 users that are making requests to the application. We can see the count of requests. This is live updating. We can also see the top 10 users that are experiencing slow endpoints, which will pretty much be all of you. And we can also see the top 10 users that are dispatching jobs. So this is capturing information about all of the requests coming into your system. And if I zoom back out again, we can also come down to this slow routes card down here. And we can see any routes 
that are over a configurable threshold. So by default, we've got 1,000 milliseconds. And this will show you the route. And we're using the route name uh, with the parameters in place. So the good thing about this is we don't have uh, a entry for every single unique flight ID, for example, into here. So they kind of get all grouped up into one. That is a lot of requests, people. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we can see, so this is the count of how many times this uh, route was over the 1,000 millisecond threshold, and we can see what the slowest one of those was. Uh, so we can see the route. We can also see uh, where the, like, the route action for it. So in this case, it's a controller, but it might be a closure or whatever else. Uh, so it makes it easy to kind of go and find you know, where that route is pointing to. So we can scroll down. We can see we've got a few little ones in there. Uh, so in terms of configuring this card, sorry, I'm not giving you motion sickness there. Let's come into here, and I'm going to uh, publish a config file. So you can control a lot of this with environment variables, but uh, let's go uh, artisan vendor publish. Uh, why is that not found? Maybe because I didn't do PHP and I don't have my aliases set up. So this is running on uh, a Forge VPS instance, so like it doesn't have all my local setup and whatnot. Um, all right, so. We're going to publish the config file. So I'm going to search for config. We get this lovely designed prompt that lets you search your vendor files. So let's come down to the pulse config. And we'll open up Vim, of course. And as I don't have all my stuff, I'll have to just browse to it the slow way. So views, uh, sorry, not views. Where am I going? Config, pulse. All right, so if we come down to the recorders section, you can see all the recorders uh, that we've got registered. So you can actually uh, potentially create some custom recorders uh, and register them here. So if we come down to the, uh, where have we got our request recorder? So we can turn this recorder off completely if we want to. We can also specify a sample rate. Uh, so what the sample rate lets you do is only sample a certain percentage of requests coming into your system. So if you've got like millions of requests, you might only want to sample, say, 10% of those, and you'll still get uh, pretty accurate readings. Uh, in the dashboard, we'll scale up those um, sampled values, but with a little tilde so that you kind of know that it is an approximation. And the general rule, I think, with sampling is uh, the more you have, the lower you can set that number without losing accuracy. But if you're only getting like a couple of requests and you set that sample rate low, it's not going to be a very good representation of what's happening. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about you know, when you might want to use that later on. This is where we can configure our threshold, so what we consider slow. So what you know, the default here is 1,000, but you might want to make that lower or higher. And you can also configure uh, patterns here using regular expressions that you want to ignore. So by default, we're ignoring the pulse route, but we wanted to put that in your control. So if you decide you actually want to see those in there, then you can just remove this entry. Right, so let's come back over here and let's look at another card. What's a good one to go to? Let's go to our queues over here. Okay, so the queues card isn't looking super amazing because we've got 5,056 jobs that have been queued. So this is the, the gray line here is the number of jobs that have been queued and that is rocketing up. But this queue worker can only process one job at a time for each queue. So these ones down here are super, super low. But you can see we can uh, move along here and see exactly what's happening. So on this uh, one hour uh, view, you've got a, a point every one minute because it's divided into 60. Uh, we can see multiple queues. So all the queues you've got running will show in here. And we can see uh, when jobs become processing, when they're processed, and when they're released, which is when a job uh, has an exception, but it will be retried, and then failed is when it completely fails. Uh, all right. Now, in terms of queues as well, so this kind of Queues in itself is not showing you that there's necessarily, like then you might be able to see a problem on here, but it also just kind of lets you know activity, and activity is generally a good thing. Uh, if we come down to our slow jobs card here, we can see the jobs that were over a configurable threshold, so again, 1,000 milliseconds, and we can show the name of the job, and we can show the name pretty much anything you can queue in Laravel. So we've got a job here, we've got a queued notification, we've got a queued command, and we can show the command name. We've got a queued closure, and we can actually show you where the line is uh, in which file that closure is. Queued mail and a queued listener over here. And so once again, we can see how many times it was over threshold. Now with slow jobs, 
The number might not look what you expect because if a job fails and is slow on each time that it fails, it will uh, increase the count each time it runs. So even if that job was queued once, it might count for multiple times down in this list here. And we can see obviously uh, what the slowest time that job ran was. Uh, so if we come over to the configuration for jobs, Pretty similar to requests, we can do uh, enable sample rate. You can configure the sample rate separately for each recorder. Uh, so if you've got a lot of requests but not many jobs, you might want to sample those differently. Um, and then you can also set up ignore patterns if there's any particular jobs that you don't want to see in the dashboard. All right, let's look at slow queries. All right, so once again, threshold based. So you'll only see queries here that are over the configurable threshold. And similar to with the, uh, the slow routes, we're only showing the, um, the query without the bindings there. And this has a few benefits. One is that it's not going to show any personal identifiable information uh, that might be in that query as long as you're using the, uh, the bindings properly. Uh, it also means that if this query is running lots of different times with different variables, it's not going to create a ton of entries in this table. Uh, so they kind of all get rolled up into one. And we can also show you the location where this came from. So if I zoom in here a little bit to make sure you can see it. So we can see where this particular query uh, originated. Now, something around this location is that if we come down, there should be some selects here. So we've got these two queries here. They're the same query, select star from flights, where ID equals question mark, limit one. And we've got the same one here. The reason this one is showing twice is because this query is happening in two different places. If I zoom in here, we've got one in this flight price controller and one in this flight ticket controller. Now you have the option, if we come over to the config and we come to uh, queries, slow queries, you can uh, choose to disable the capturing of location. And what this will give you is the, it will roll up those queries effectively into one because it considers those as now, uh, you know, like each occurrence of that query, no matter where it is, is, is all grouped together. But you do lose the ability to easily see where it came from. So it's up to you whether or not, uh, like what's more valuable for you. You can also add ignore patterns. So by default, we're ignoring anything to do with the pulse tables that are being used here. But again, you can remove that if you would like. Um, and of course you can configure the thresholds and so on. So we're getting a lot of slow queries in here. Um, and yeah, all over that one second threshold. Uh, what should we tackle next? Uh, I want to do, what do I want to do? I want to do exceptions. Uh, so we can see exceptions that are being thrown in the system. We can see when the latest occurrence of that exception was. So this one was two seconds ago and the count of how many times this exception has occurred. We can also sort this by the recency. So we'll see the most recent ones at the top. Uh, we can see the exception and we can also see the location. Uh, which makes it easy to track it down. But we should also see we've got a request exception here and we've got one up here. And again, these are in two different locations. So similarly to the queries, you can come into here and come to exceptions and you can disable the recording of that location. If you want to group those together, that's up to you. But by default, we want to capture the location because personally, I think that's, uh, that's more useful, but it's, it's hard to predict what uh, everyone's apps are going to be like. So you've got that one there. And of course, you can ignore exceptions and change sample rates, all that sort of stuff. Uh, all right, so which one shall we do next? I reckon we do the cache one. Uh, so if I scroll up to the top of this one here, we can see the uh, total number of cache hits in the application, the total number of misses, and the hit rate. We can also break this down by key. So we can see here we've got all these flights with different IDs on here. We've got all these different user ones. Uh, so this is a little bit kind of noisy with the amount of keys we've got in here. And we've limited this to 100 entries. So the reason we can't group these together out of the box is because we don't know what your key structure is going to look like. Like with queries, the bindings make that easy to kind of you know, take away the unique parts of the same query. Same with uh, our routes down here kind of you know, easy for us to automatically group those up. But these ones here, uh, we'll need you to do a little bit of stuff to group those up. So let's come over to the config file and we'll come over to, if I can spell cache correctly, 
All right, so we've got a bunch of ignore patterns here. So by default, we're ignoring any of the internal pulse keys, any of the internal uh, Laravel framework keys. We've also got this crazy uh, regular expression here, uh, which is just to do with uh, the breeze and jet stream rate limiting. But again, you might want to get rid of this. I also like that these kind of give you almost like a serving suggestion of how you might want to uh, add your own ignores if you want to add them, and also any uh, session IDs. But we have this groups for cache. So I'm going to uncomment this one. And this regular expression is looking for a colon followed by one or more digit characters. And then it's going to replace that with a colon and an asterisk. So if I save this file, and then if I come over to our admin server, I should be able to run, I think I have an alias for that, pulse regroup. Yes, we want to do this. Let's see if we get these rolled up into one now. Oh, actually, I need to run on this server. So because I've got two servers here with separate config files, I'm like editing config files you know, live on the server, which you wouldn't normally do, but for the demo, we want to do that. So let's run that over here. So this one has the config file that we've changed. It's going to go through and regroup all these. Now you don't need to run this regroup command uh, like normally, you would only ever run this if you were uh, wanting to kind of fix existing keys that you've recorded. There's a lot of them here. There we go. And so now if we let this refresh, these have now rolled up into just two keys. And we can, and all, you know, all of the, uh, the number of hits and all of those kind of all get grouped together for that. So that kind of lets us see, because like generally with, with cache keys, we don't, we want to see how often the key in general is being used. Generally not like, oh, I want to know how often ID one is being used. It's just, is this particular way that I'm caching this, uh, is that being used valuably? So I find it's, yeah, generally that's the way we want to see that. Uh, let's come down to our slow outgoing requests. So this is using, uh, if you're using Laravel's built-in HTTP client to make requests. Uh, so this, again, will capture any of those slow outgoing requests that are over this 1,000 millisecond uh, threshold as the default, showing the count of how many times it was over that threshold and what the slowest one was. Uh, we can load the little avatar and whatnot for those. So many records. Um, and we can see, whoops, sorry. And yeah, we can see the method and all that sort of stuff. So this has a similar problem to the cache one where we've got these endpoints that are effectively the exact same endpoint, but with a different ID. Uh, you might also, maybe you just want to group them together by domain name. Uh, if you just want to see generally it's uh, requests to say GitHub or something slow. So if we come back over to our config and we come to our outgoing requests. Uh, so you can ignore outgoing requests. Uh, We've got one in here for the Inertia SSR server, but at the moment, we're not going to ship that enabled by default. So you will see uh, any requests your Laravel app makes to the Inertia SSR server. But if you don't want to see those, then you can just uncomment this one out of the box. Uh, so I've got a few other serving suggestions here. It's hard to know, you know what we'll end up shipping with it, but uh, this is what we've got for now. Uh, so this one's similar to that other one where we're looking for a forward slash this time followed by one or more digits, and we're going to replace that with a forward slash and an asterisk. So we'll save that one. We'll run our regroup command. And that'll go through and regroup all of those keys together. And if we come back over here, let it refresh. All right, so now we just have these are the kind of unique requests for each domain with the, the ID part of that normalized and all of that grouped together. Uh, all righty. So, uh, all right, so that's kind of uh, all of the cards we've got here. Uh, so I want to talk about performance for a little bit. So as I mentioned earlier, Pulse collects as minimal data as possible to display what's here so that it can be run uh, in production. And just for kind of reference, we've been running this on Forge. We effectively built this to scratch our own itch with Forge because we wanted to see some of these insights with Forge. And so we've been running it on Laravel Forge and we get about 2 million requests per day and we have not had to enable any sampling uh, and it is able to handle all of that. So we added sampling kind of as like a, 
a safety net just in case, but it's actually being able to handle kind of more than we expected that it would, which is pretty cool. Uh, so by default, Laravel Pulse will do uh, will save the requests or the, the information from the recorders directly to your application database. It'll do this after the request has been sent to the user. So it shouldn't uh, change the speed at which the user receives their request, but it will keep that worker kind of active and unable to service the next request until it's finished doing that uh, insert, which is generally going to be very, very, very quick. But we do have uh, a number of options to help you scale this if you kind of do run into anything. Uh, so one of the options you can do is create a dedicated database for Pulse. The main reason you'd probably want to do this is if you've got a lot of data going in and your requests to the dashboard were maybe uh, impacting the, the database that serves the rest of your application. So you can set up a dedicated database for it. Uh, you can also, though, use a Redis ingest. So what this will do is, instead of uh, during the request and job lifecycle saving directly to the database, it'll put it on a Redis stream, which is lightning fast to just chuck data on that stream. And then you can have a background process that will pick up that data and insert it in completely outside of the request lifecycle. So that uh, can definitely help to speed things up. You can also run Pulse on a dedicated instance if you felt the need to. For this demo, I felt the need to because I wasn't sure if you guys were going to take down the demo app. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't want to pay for a massive droplet. So, uh, so yes, yeah, this dashboard is actually running on a completely different server than the, uh, the one you've been using on your phones. Um, and what else have we got? So we've mentioned sampling. So you can also use sampling if you find that you want to do anything there. And we also have the ability to create custom drivers. So you might want to create a custom driver for ingesting data and maybe even a custom driver for persisting that data. Uh, so by default, we're going to ship with database for storage and the optional Redis ingest, but I'm sure that uh, there'll be many other ones potentially coming out. Uh, all right, so now I wanted to talk about uh, how we can customize Pulse. So I don't have a huge amount of time left. Let's see how we go. All right, so the first thing I want to do is come over onto our admin server that's hosting the dashboard. And I'm going to say vendor publish. And I want to publish the Pulse dashboard. So this has just published a single laid file into your resources directory. So let's go and open that one. Resources, views, vendor, Pulse dashboard. And in here, it's hard to kind of see it all. We've got these comments. I don't know if I'm going to keep these ones. We'll see. But here's where we can customize our dashboard. So Pulse is written in Livewire. And that gives us the uh, ability to let you customize what you can see without having to do any sort of build step. Uh, so for example, if I come into here and I change full width to true for the, uh, the big Pulse component on the outside, I'll probably have to zoom out a little bit for this one and then refresh. So that'll now kind of fill the screen. Uh, so let's go back into normal on that one, and let's change this here. You can customize the amount of columns that are available for cards. So by default, we're going to go with 12, because that kind of gives you, you can divide it into uh, a lot of interesting sort of size cards. Uh, our service card is full by default. Uh, we've got some other kind of suggestions over here. So we've got this usage card. If I just remind you of what that one was, I'll refresh over here. So this usage card here is spanning two rows. So we can see here it's got rows two, and it's spanning four columns. So that's effectively one third of those 12 columns. Uh, but we could come in here, and we can basically get rid of this rows. And that one will now kind of collapse up here. And then it's kind of up to you to like come in and fill in some of these gaps. Uh, now, with this usage card, you can switch between viewing all these things. But maybe if you're running this on a big screen in your office, and you don't have a mouse and keyboard attached to it, and you actually want to see all of these things individually, you can use the same card, but you can pass a type to it. So I'm going to delete this one, and I'm going to uncomment these without any Vim plugins. Let's see how fast we can go. Lovely. And I'll refresh this. And so now we can see our top 10 users dispatching jobs, our top 10 users experiencing slow endpoints, and our top 10 users making requests. This queues card here is now looking a little bit short. So let's come over here. And we'll give that one six so that it fills half of the screen. Cards are six columns by default. 
And so now that should be filling up our screen nicely there. So you can kind of customize the order where you want to position them, how big you want them to be. All of these cards are individually responsive using CSS container queries. So this card here was a single column when it fit, when it could only fit that. Uh, but if you make the column wider, it will kind of expand to fill that regardless of the, the size of the, the screen. It's all related to the size of the card. So I'm very grateful that CSS container queries exist now. Um, all right, so the one last thing I wanted to show you was custom cards. So Pulse allows you to add your own cards because Pulse by default is basically uh, showing you information about a Laravel app. But when we're making our apps, they've often got a lot of business specific features, of course. And maybe you want to show some of those. So I did create a card, which I'm going to pop up here at the top. Let's say live wire flights. And we'll save that one and we'll refresh our dashboard. And now we've got our flights card. So we can see from all of your activity that you sold 8,635 tickets in total. That is very impressive. The revenue you generated was 40 million. I'm very glad I put truncate on here because I was worried that it might go uh, very, very large. But we can hover on this and see, yeah, 41 million. This is going up. Crazy. 8,236 delays. Did anyone have a delay on their flight to get to Laracon? <laughs> Uh, and yeah, this many cancellations. And in this case, we can see also who made our most sales. Uh, so it looks like Edison has won basically everything. Whoever got assigned the name Edison Legros, you have effectively won all of the, uh, all of the stats here. Uh, all right, so that is Laravel Pulse. Uh, and we are hoping to launch this probably next week. Uh, and yeah, just once again, a big thank you, especially to Tim McDonald, because he did about 50% of the work on this thing. We paired on this together. It's been super fun. So I'm very, very appreciative to work with Tim McDonald. And yeah, that's Pulse. Way, 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 way to knock it out of the park. Two product launches this year. Well done, Jess. Um, you all had a lot of questions, and I didn't get to hear a lot of what Jess had to say. So to avoid making myself look like an idiot for asking questions that she answered in her talk, we'll collaborate, and we'll do a little bit of a Pulse Q&A with the, with the Laravel team later on. Love but it. the one question that I'm pretty sure you may not have answered, I hope, someone asked, what do they do with all the money that they're paying to New Relic right now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Sponsor the conference. Yes, yeah, sponsor, sponsor open source. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Jess. Thank you.